The Book of Recollections, Episode 25, The Cold Truth, by Dysylvania. My, my, back for seconds. I'd be happy to oblige. I am the Book of Recollections, your host for this evening. Let us have a look at the specials and see what our adventurers have been cooking. The chapel opened, and on the other side, to Jen and Lysander's surprise, a visibly upset Leo appeared, looking rather sternly at the bard's hand touching the dampiers. Leo had found his way into the torchant chamber that led him towards the chapel. Finding only bones, they decided it would be best to turn back to the trophy chamber through the torture room. They went across, avoiding the puddles of blood, but by the time Lysander pulled open the door on the other side, a wild Mr. Fang appeared from the chapel and started frantically running towards them. No matter how hard Jen tried to convince him he was a free man now, Henry Fang wouldn't hear it and clawed Jen out on her way out but didn't manage to actually grab her. The three reached an unfamiliar chamber, filled with white mist and a very humid atmosphere. A swing in the middle, a bed with elegant linens and a flowy canopy, and an eerie laughter were covering the room. Lysander let out darkness, who proceeded to slurp the canopy curtains, the swing in the center and a perfume bottle in the shape of a fist. Assessing the damages, Lysander caught darkness and placed it back into his rucksack. The creepy but familiar laughter reappeared, and, after Lysander strongly urged him to face it, his soul renounced her invisibility. She claimed she only wanted to get more acquainted with them, while slowly getting undressed. But Leo luckily saw through her act and wasn't faced. Jen questioned her loyalty, demanding some proof, while a deflated Lysander kept complaining about the seduction process being far too easy. Leo then pulled a violin to help ward off her charms, so Isolde, seeing her lack of success, turned invisible once more, while spewing unpleasantries back and forth with Jen. All the while, Kate was still in the basin room trying to figure out a way to get some water to fill it, while being constantly bombarded by riddles from Lady Seraphine. Kaith left in hopes of finding a bathroom, but the corridor splitting in two only led her back to the trophy room. Frustrated, she opened the door again, only to find herself in the bathroom in which Lysander had earlier taken a bath. She found a few sponges and a crate, tried to fill those sponges with as much ice water as she could, then stumbled her way back into the basin room. After squeezing all the sponges, the water filling the basin stood very still, materializing an image similar to the one in the Church of Lunai. Lady Seraphine joined her, telling her about the common ancestry and how elves originated from a place called Winterheim, and offering assistance in the form of an acquaintance she had there should Kaith wish to find out more about her origins. Before the lady had a chance to pull out some more riddles from her memory, Leo, Jen and Lysander plunged through the door. Jen questioned Seraphine's loyalty, so she decided to find out more on how to successfully get rid of a vampire. Lady Seraphine explained the cumbersome process, first dematerializing them, then Following their shadow to the coffins, they would regain their strength and, while regenerating, impale their heart and incinerate them with a flame of solace. She then proceeded to warn them. After the events of tonight, the vampires would never cease to track them. Lysander had the idea to claim the castle, but the domain was linked to the heart of Eleanor, which, in fact, was a piece of Obscura himself, making the siege near impossible. But Seraphine revealed that she had other plans in mind. She wished to form a stronger clan, challenging Jen to a battle for leadership. If Jen succeeded, Seraphine would be second in command. But Jen is reluctant, wishing to solve the mystery with her grandmother's heart before even considering leading her own clan. So. Seraphine agrees to point them in the right direction, towards her Winterheim acquaintance, but not before performing the ritual to seal the pact between her and Jen, ensuring thus no betrayal could arise from either of them. She then 
left them with the name of the Night Watcher and two options for Jen to unbind the heart from Eleanor. Either her grandmother would give it up willingly, or they would have to perform a dark ritual with a duel to the death between her and Eleanor. The group then joined hands and started uttering a prayer to Lune to help guide their way. The water started bubbling, and a clear image of a white realm started to form. However, right before they were about to jump in, the door burst open and the Baron, followed by Mr. Fang, were ready to attack. The adventurers plunged into the basin, but the Baron superficially slashed Lysander, who went in last, allowing him to see the exact location the party was heading to. On the other side, they were surrounded by hills, mountains and skies, pale and white. Falling, Miniscule rain freezing to the touch was all around them. Seraphine bid them farewell, kissed Lysander and went to Stedheim to gather her allies. Freezing, the group dragged closer to stay warm and figure out a plan. Keith noticed a shy, bluish figure hiding from a tree and recognized her to be Lune. But at the sight of her, Lysander went berserk and started furiously marching towards her, dragging along Keith, who attempted to stop him. Jen also intervened, but to no avail. While Lysander was cussing and unleashing his anger towards Lune. Still, that did not deter the Astral to point them towards a hut, offering her blessing until they reached shelter. The cabin was very modest, most likely used by fishermen. It had a small bed, a fireplace in the center, which they quickly lit up to defrost, while Leo went outside. Lysander and Lune also went in front of the hut to speak more privately, leaving behind a baffled Jen and Kate. Lysander wished to renounce his so-called gift received from Lune, seeing it as more of a curse. But the astral, Underlined that he must be the one to find a way to remove the blessing, for the rules in place would not allow her. Lysander begged her to kill him instead, threatening that he would do it himself. Nevertheless, Lune refused, claiming that if it were not for her blessing, he would have already been gone. He pulled out his sword plunging its tip into the snow, but he was stopped dead in his tracks by Leo, who was just returning to the hut. No matter how hard Leo tried to convince him to forsake his malevolent idea, Lysander was still prepared to go through with it. But Lune would not allow it, and simply made his sword disappear from in front of him and appear inside a wooden crate, cleaned and polished. With a loud, angry yell, Lysander went back into the hut. Leo stayed back to talk to Lune and discovered thus that there was a tunnel that would lead them all the way into the city, but that they would have to prove themselves to find its passage. Inside, Lysander told her story to the rest of the group. His mother, who worshipped Saturni, was supposed to keep only one child alive. She had already lost five children when she tried to do the same to Lysander, but Solis intervened to save him. According to Lune, Solis asked her to bestow her blessing upon him. He was not sure what his curse was, only that once the full moon hit, he would always find himself covered in blood the next day. He had many casualties under his belt. People orphanages, even his beloved fiance, his first love, or his only brother who was supposed to be the only one left to live. After some much needed rest, the group woke up the following morning determined to find the tunnel into town. Luckily enough, while Lysander was searching for an appropriate toilet, he so happened to unceremoniously stumble upon the entrance into the tunnel. The road was long but they were protected from the harsh environment none of them had previously encountered. Leo stayed a bit behind to have a discussion with Jen about what transpired in her grandparents' castle. He admitted that her proposal was interpreted as a ruse to trap Eleanor, but he revealed his true feelings in the form of a poem that also reminded him of his late sister Cassandra. The love poem made it clear to Jen that while she struggled with her grandmother's heart, she would always have Leo's. Up front, 
Lysander and Keith stopped for a moment to catch their breath. Lysander then pulled a cloak from his backpack, a small candle and two plates, one of which was consumed by darkness. To answer Kate's puzzled look, he asked her to sit down and talk about herself, apologizing for the improvised date. The conversation was flowing, naturally so, both of them seeming more relaxed than they had been in the past few days. Then Lysander got up and started singing, extending a hand towards Kate and asking her for a dance. They enjoyed a few moments of joy before continuing on with their journey. Getting out of the tunnel through the bottom of a tree root, the party realized they had reached the town. Being surrounded by a few dozen houses, making their way towards the town center where an ancient tree was burning. On the way, a small elven child with blushing cheeks welcomed them to Winterheim. They offered to help him carry his boxes while the boy told them all about Master Whitetaker, who had a tavern but also seemed to be in charge. They familiarized themselves with the currency used, which bore runes very similar to the ones Keith had seen in Floki's books. When the group mentioned the Night Watcher, the elven boy revealed his name to be Mr. Frostmender, the person in charge of protecting the town. And he told the party that he was their next stop for the box delivery. They reached the house with a smoking chimney, opened the door and saw a tall, large man in red and white robes sitting at his desk and reviewing some paperwork. He raised his head, let out a jolly laughter and beckoned them in. This was the recap for episode 25 of Vim, as told by the Book of Recollections. I was Edward, your Vim recap narrator. If you'd like to join us, as Vim The Tale of Immortality premieres, tune in on Sunday at 5 o'clock p.m. UTC on youtube.com slash at Dicelvania. New recaps drop every Friday evening. And remember, every subscribe keeps the magic alive. Thank you for sticking with us. Good day, good night, and don't let the vampires bite.